introduce Professor Daniel Boyarin, who has been unabashed and unafraid to raise his voice in some of the most sometimes unpopular opinions and his fierce determination. I can say personally that as a new young rabbinic student, one of the first books I read was Colonel Israel, his second book of 14. And it was so profoundly inspiring to me that his concept of the Yitzhar Hara, our evil inclination and what it could be and what it could mean for our lives. I knew that it was a voice that was gonna to continue to make in tremendous inroads. And as you know, as you can see from Professor Boyarin's bio, he has a prolific legacy. He has been on the faculty for over 30 years at UC Berkeley in scholarship for over 50. And I am so equally pleased to that he has joined as his interviewer with Michael Berenbaum. Together they have over a hundred years of scholarship. And I just said to them before we met um, publicly that a hundred years of scholarship of not just words, but words that have changed the Jewish zeitgeist, have changed the larger world, that have impacted the way people think about Israel and anti-Zionism. I'm pleased that we get to call Professor Berenbaum our own from American Jewish University. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Michael Berenbaum in conversation with Daniel Boyarin at this year's Bachelor Lectureship. Take it away, Michael. Thank you very much, Sherry. It's a pleasure to be here this uh, afternoon. And welcome, Daniel. I look forward to our conversation uh, enormously. Uh, Daniel, let's start. Um, you've entitled uh, your newest work, A Manifesto. What motivated you? And you've also entitled it The No State Solution in a world in which people are speaking about a one state and a two state solution. Uh, Why do you write the manifesto? And what is the one state, uh, the no state solution? Um, I am um, passionately committed to the notion of the Jewish nation as a diaspora nation. Up till now, we've been given only two possibilities. Either the Jews are a religion, or the Jews are a nation, and nation has been understood to mean a nation state, right? Um, what I'm developing in my thinking and in my work is the notion of a nation that is not encompassed, controlled, um, embodied in a state, certainly not in a single state, but um, is itself a political and cultural entity distributed uh, among many states all over the world. Let's in touch short diaspora. Let's touch uh, about the word diaspora, and you're deliberately choosing diaspora instead of exile. Yes. Tell us why. Oh, but ex exile is a particular. Uh, I mean, in, in Jewish use usage. I'm not referring to exile, exile in the sense like Ovid was exiled, exiled to uh, Pontus, uh, but <clears throat> exile, galut, in Jewish usage is a theological condition. It's a, um, a, a state of imperfection, which the whole world is in, right? The whole world is in exile. The Shrina, the divine presence is in exile. And uh, we, we understand theologically that the whole world will be turned upside down someday, Mir Tzushim, to end that condition of, of exile. But exile is not only a theological concept. I mean, in Jewish mysticism, it's clearly a theological concept. One could probably argue that one of the core narratives of 
and we'll talk about whether it's the Jewish nation or the Jewish people, but one could uh, clearly argue that exile and return is a core narrative of the Jewish nation. Absolutely. And, and I would probably even argue that it's not only a core narrative, probably is the core narrative. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. That return will take place when the Mashiach comes and, uh, and we all um, end exile. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a messianic maximalist, you know, uh, and um, firmly believe in the, in the coming of the Mashiach uh, at some time. And if we were talking, if we were talking theo theology, I would say that I believe with a perfect faith that the Messiah has not yet come. Absolutely. <laughs> Me too. And that, and that's probably my easiest and uh, most basic right. uh, belief as a Jew. Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, when Christians ask me, and as they do, I, I have a lot of conversations with Christians, uh, very friendly ones and very frank ones. And so when certain kinds of Christians ask me, so why don't um, I accept Jesus as the Messiah. I have nothing against Jesus being the Messiah, but he didn't do the job. The, <laughs> you know? uh, so they say, well, he's going to come again and do the job. I said, when he, when he comes again and does the job, I'll accept him as the Mashiach. But uh, I, I, I don't see uh, any particular reason why um, I have to accept uh, this particular um this particular Jew as the Messiah. Let me, uh, let me ask, let me ask you, uh, let's probe this in, in another way. Um, last Sunday, Jews throughout the world observed to Shabbat. Yes. Uh, if I read you correctly, uh, you would theologically have a very different view of to Shabbat than the ordinary Jews sitting on the floor in the synagogue sing lamentations i don't think so because um according to uh the official line of discourse um that official line that i resist um once the state of israel was founded there shouldn't be any more tisha B'av, right so obviously since there is tisha B'av, all over the world for those quote unquote ordinary Jews, um, as well as in Israel, uh, then clearly the exile that I experience and share with those other Jews is not about some uh, contemporary real politic uh, thing, but it's about something that we're still waiting for namely uh, uh, some kind of redemption. Um, well, I, I'm going back, though. Tisha B'Av is also about um, um, the loss of the nation state, the destruction of the temple, and the quotation marks exile of the Jewish people. Um, but if I read you correctly, then diaspora, diaspora, or the the no state solution diaspora, Tisha B'av enabled the uh, I don't want to say the birth of the nation, but its transformation into a very different and, in your mind, very creative phase. Yes, exactly. Um, in my uh, my work in progress, nearly done, the book that you alluded to. I say, it's not so much that the temple was destroyed on the 9th of Av that constitutes the Jewish nation, but the fact that we all sit and fast on the 9th of Av. In other words, it's, it's our shared commemorations, our shared practices, our shared Torah, our shared learning that constitutes the, the Jews as a as a nation. Talk a little bit about the nation versus uh, a Jewish people. 
Oh, I don't, I don't know what Jewish people means. I don't know what the term people means in that. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm not uh, 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 speaking disingenuously. I may be speaking ingenuously. No, I, I don't. I, I'm not taking. I just don't. I, I'm not you know, taking disingenuously. You know, I have this wonderful book. Maybe if I hold it up, um, can people see? Jewish peoplehood. Yeah. Is it backwards? Or can you? No, it's perfect. Good. Jewish peoplehood. And what's the subtitle? An American Innovation. An American Innovation. This book was written by a very, very fine scholar, professor of Jewish history at uh, the University of Washington, Noam Pianco, who was uh, up till very recently the president of the uh, uh, um, Association for Jewish Studies. The American Association for Jewish Studies, right? And he demonstrates that the term people and peoplehood was actually invented in the 19th century um, uh, or so in America to avoid Jewish nationalism, to avoid us being a nation. Now, I'm a Jewish nationalist. Uh, and uh, and I want to I want to assert that I'm a Jewish nationalist, but I argue strenuously in my work, and I and I think I've got the text to back to back it up, that it is only recently, that is in the last hundred years or so, that uh, let's, let's stress let's stress to those who are with us that a hundred years in Jewish history is a. Uh, a drop in a drop in the bucket. Yeah, exactly. Between the between you and me, they just said we have a hundred years of scholarship, right? So, uh, <laughs> of course, we did. Uh, we uh, we had parallel sentences, not uh, subsequent sentences. <laughs> we served our time at the same time. Sure. <laughs> but um, you know, so um, and basically, only since World War Two that the idea of a uh, nation state has been inseparable from the idea of a nation. Even the great, great early thinkers of Zionism, <coughs> Pinsker, and even Herzl, in, in so much of their writing, in most of their writing, Pinsker forever, never imagined a sovereign Jewish state. At the foundations of uh, even of Zionism, they didn't imagine a sovereign Jewish state. They imagined autonomous Jewish, an autonomous Jewish region under the aegis of a much larger multinational state. <laughs> What is the Hebrew for the Jewish nation? What is the Yiddish for the Jewish nation? Yeah, uh, that's easy. Am Yisrael is the, uh, is the Hebrew. It's also Yiddish and Yiddish of folk. Yeah, right. So, And, and would but, you know the Ladino for that? Uh, I, I don't mean to stump you. I'm just... Uh, uh, I don't actually, but even in Spanish, so I imagine in, in Ladino also, uh, Nacion has only in the, uh, according to the, the, the national, the Spanish national dictionary, you know, the equivalent of Ben Yehuda for, uh, for Spanish or of the Oxford English dictionary for Spanish, uh, it's only in the 19th century that the word nacion became associated with with state. Um, I don't mean to be uh, deflecting um, the conversation away from our um, so uh, let's uh, go uh, Spanish speaking. Let's brothers. go. Let's go and ask you what constitutes the Jewish nation. Um, that we learn Gemara, and this is not a question of being religious or not. 
I'm I'm thrilled to know that um, thousands of people now who would define themselves as secularists, as Yiddishists, as as communists, as uh, socialists, as uh, are 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 learning uh, Talmud every day. Um, that's obviously only one part of it. I'm not saying the Talmud is the be all and the end all, but it, uh, but it is an important part that shared practice, um, and especially um, it doesn't make for great learning, but it makes for great people making. That is Jewish people or Jewish nation making the dafyomi, the custom, also fairly recent custom, know, about about a hundred years old, of uh, Jews all over the world studying a particular page, the same page, being on the same page. So being on the same page is an important part of uh, uh, of what constitutes uh, the Jewish people. Talk also about the role of language in this, because I found that a very intriguing part of your um, yeah. your work. Absolutely, uh, and and that language that is shared which is not just Yiddish, but it's Yiddish and Judesmo, right? Uh, Ladino is, is, is the written form of uh, this language that is called Judesmo. Judesmo means the same thing as Yiddish, right? It means Jewish. And the uh, probably 432 other Jewish languages that we've had uh, through history, Judeo-Tajik, Judeo-Persian, uh, uh, Judeo-Uzbek, um, um, Judeo-Arabic, of course, very prominently, um, has extensive literature. These, they, what is shared by the, the Jewish languages is the impact of the Talmud on on the modes of speech. This has been demonstrated by linguists. I didn't, uh, neither, neither did I discover this, nor am I making it up. It's, it's well documented. Um, so that shared component um, of usages, of even intonation that we say, sounds Jewish, right? It sounds Jewish. Even when it's an Italian from New York speaking, a lot of times it sounds Jewish. Well, it's not not surprising. There were a lot of Jews in New York, um, and a lot of Jew and a lot of Jews who interacted with a lot of Italians. Exactly. That's that's the point. You know, Lenny Bruce said somewhat provocatively, "If you live in New York or Los Angeles, you're Jewish. If you don't, you're not." So we're talking about common text. We're talking about common language. What about common memories? Yes, that common, that's Tisha B'Av is the site par excellence of common memory. That is, that's, that's why I was so happy you, you brought it up. Um, I mean, of course, it's the this is it's in Yana de Yoma. It's the season for it because uh, it was this week was Tisha B'av, and uh, next week is Shabbos Nachamu, the uh, the Sabbath of 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 comforting and the beginning of preparing for uh, for 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 the end of that. But so that is the site of Jewish memory par excellence. It's not the only one, of course. Um, and the, but what I want to emphasize is that memory is not about a thing. It, it operates as being about a thing, but memory is what's happening now. Memory is what's happening in, 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 in the brains uh, metaphorically, because I don't know what it is, in the souls, in the minds, and the practices of Tisha B'Av stimulate those 
mental and spiritual um, and, and the fact that we're all doing it all over the world and that we have been doing it all over the world for well over a thousand years um, is to my mind what, what makes Jewish nationhood alive. You subtitled your book a manifesto. Yes. So a manifesto has one meaning, which is it's what you have to say. It's what you have to contribute. And you're now um, retiring quotation marks from uh, teaching at Berkeley. So this is in one sense, uh, you're pushing this out into the world as a statement, uh, as we should say, in the years of your wisdom in the biblical years of your wisdom. Uh, but a manifesto, the question I want to ask you is, who do you think it is your audience? And um, let me ask it in a, in a little bit of um, a tougher way by saying that um, many people who accept the question of the Jewish nation um, would say, we have a Jewish nation which is, looks like it's migrating out of the diaspora into the land of Israel. And it, I'm not sure that you would have a distinct following in the land of Israel of those who have bought into Zionism. So the question is, this is what you have to say, to whom are you saying it and whom do you expect to, um, to grasp it and absorb it? Um thoughtful folk, folk who are inter alia, deeply, deeply disturbed and discomfited by what the state of Israel has become. This is not the, the, the main point of what I wanted to say today, but you asked and I'm going to answer as honestly as I can. And very troubled by the thought that that state gets to co-opt the whole Jewish nation and say, we are the Jewish nation to the point where uh, uh, someone like uh, Sharansky recently published a, uh, a piece in Tablet, where I publish also, by the way, um, he published a piece in Tablet arguing that anybody who does not support the Jewish state, which he equates with supporting the Jewish nation, is an un-Jew, right? Is an un-Jew. By doing that, he in fact completely undermines his own argument. Because nations don't get to decide that members of their nations are un, un members because they disagree with them. That's what political parties can do. Religions can, can excommunicate people and call them heretics. Political parties can kick people out, as the Labour Party in, in England is doing on, on right and on left, mostly on left. Uh, lately, they're kicking out the socialists, they're kicking out the, right? But nations can't kick people out. Daniel, I'm going to jump in here. Your comments are very provocative. And something you just said is, you know, if the state of Israel doesn't do things you like, then you can push it away. Don't, I'm not paraphrasing so well, but let's say the state of Israel did do what you like. Then would your whole theory be out the door? No, no, uh, uh, because I'm primarily interested in the in the diaspora message. If so this, the, so I would for, be I would be very happy to welcome some the the state of Israel into into the diaspora as as a very very important component of the diaspora. It's where probably there's the highest concentration of Jews in the world now. Um, it's where Hebrew is the, the daily speech. And as we know, 
when people speak a language, they know it much better. Uh, you know, uh, Jews who know Hebrew and use Hebrew uh, have a much better time working with ancient Hebrew texts than even very, very, very well-educated uh, dons uh, at Oxford and Cambridge. Um, uh, so it's it's where Hebrew creativity is is much um, more vibrant and fructifying. Than, so uh, my objection is to it being called the, first of all, to it being called the Jewish state, right? Um, which is wrong for two things. First of all, it excludes uh, or forces to include uh, all the Jews in the in the world into one particular political model, and what everyone say, the Jewish state is a political uh, political entity. What do you say to the person who is a Jew, not interested in studying text or language, and doesn't define memory in the present? Uh, are they a Jew? Oh, I don't kick anybody out. I'm talking about what what I imagine will produce a vibrant future for the Jews as a nation. I'm not I'm not I'm not in the business of defining people as non-Jews. I just explicitly said a nation can't. I, uh, for instance, I disagree very very uh, fervently with uh, someone who. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to name because I don't know how public she is on this, but a, a prominent Jewish thinker and scholar who thinks that uh, that we should simply define people. Uh, I forget his name. The uh, you know the, the 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 gambling and and whorehouse uh, man who made billions of dollars and was a big supporter. Uh, of, Allison. Yeah. So. Right? Oh. I think he's Sheldon, gone, right? Sheldon Adelson. Yeah, that's what I mean. Sheldon Adelson. And and this person was in favor of somehow a schism in which we would define such people as not Jews. No, because I don't believe that Jew, the Jews are a religion or a political party. And the same way I can't define some uncle of mine this is a fictional uncle. I don't have such an uncle, but I can't define some uncle of mine who's sitting in prison for a heinous crime is not my uncle. He's still my uncle. What can I do? Right. So I, I don't I don't uh, kick people out or define people as not Jews. But as I say, what I'm what I, my manifesto for. And this goes back to Michael's very smart question. Uh, uh, is a um, passionate and I hope reasoned statement of how I imagine, and it's not perfect by any means, and I say that it's not perfect, how I imagine a vibrant and ethical future for the Jewish nation in the world. So we have a lot of questions about the purpose of Israel. Because of Israel, uh, you know, diaspora without Israel led to the Shoah. Without Israel, X will happen. How do you respond to those comments? They don't know what's going to happen. And I don't know what's going to happen. There's absolutely no reason to think that the Jewish nation is safer in the world because of, uh, of, of the state of Israel. Uh, there's a, a good argument to be made that the Talmud makes, that the Babylonian Talmud, that's a very bad idea, very bad idea to have all the Jews in one place. So there is a projection that if they were all in one place, that could be a dangerous. Exactly. The Talmud talks, you know, the Talmud says, why, why were the Jews exiled Dafka to Babylonia? Right. This is, I don't have the exact citation, but it's more in Shabbos. And the answer is because that way they're not all under the Roman Empire 
right? But they're in, in two completely different and opposed uh, political situations, and uh, they can't all be killed because some somebody wants to uh, kill all the Jews of the Roman Empire, for instance, right? So um, they don't know. You know, I'll tell you something that my son says. My son says, they say the following. We American Jews have to support the state of Israel with money, with politics, with, with whatever. Because if we don't support the state of Israel, the state of Israel won't be able to, to manage to exist. Right? And why do we need the state of Israel? Because someday in America, they're going to turn against the Jews and attack us. And if there's no state of Israel, we won't be able to go there. But if, the, if there's no American support for Israel, you just told me the state of Israel is not viable. Uh, one of our participants um, said, in Israeli, I'm horrified at the notion that you deny the existing of the state of Israel. It's not a perfect state, uh, which one is, but it's our state, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, that's an attitude that uh, many Jews share. And the question is, why would you not share it? And let's add to that one other comment uh, somebody uh, said. You seem to be speaking about multiple languages, but not Hebrew itself. And after all, a plurality of the Jewish people now speak Hebrew. Uh, we can also say that a majority of the Jewish people now speak English. Why has English not become a Jewish language by that notion either? Um, you can imagine I'm much more interested by the second questions than the first. Gesundheit, uh, he wants to be proud. Let him be proud. You know, that's my answer to the first. I'm not particularly enamored of pride uh, in general. I mean, except for vis a vis my grandchildren, Kenahara. You know. But, uh, um, you know, uh, the second question is, is, is absolutely right. And, uh, and these, are, these are not, uh, these are, neither of these points are things that I have forgotten about. But, uh, you know, can give the whole Torah in one Zoom, in one Zoom hour. I have entertained the possibility of the English becoming the world Jewish language. And I'm, I am very, um, committed to a world Jewish people, right? And a world Jewish people will need, in my, in my imagination of a Jewish nation or a Jewish people, uh, will need a language. So the, uh, shared, shared language is a vital component of, of, of a, uh, a diaspora. Um, and, it, and the only two choices are exactly what your respondent or correspondent suggested, either Hebrew or uh, some version of English, you know. You know, the sort of English where you say, okay, I was a little late picking you up. Did you have a Havamina that I wouldn't come or that I forgot, right? That kind of English. Um, and the kind of Hebrew that I imagine is a language that I call Judeo-Hebrew. It, it may be fed by the Israeli language, which is getting further and further away from anything recognizable as Hebrew. Uh, certainly that will be, would be a vital component, but it will not be identical. Right? It'll have much more... Uh, Jewish kite, that's a word I've invented, uh, um, to get away from just, you know, f focusing on Yiddish um, in it, then uh, uh, that. Um, so, yes, I simply assert that question number two is absolutely correct. And I don't have the answer. Well, in, but in, in an interesting way, a common language, and we're all uh, indebted to Sarah for her work, to Sarah Benor with 
uh, her work on, on Jewish languages. Uh, sorry, say her name. We're all indebted to Sarah Benor on her Absolutely. Work. She's, work on I, I thought that's who you were saying. Yes, she is, she is my, uh, uh, a, a light unto my feet. I've never met her, but I love her work. Well, I've met her, I've met her and I love her work also, but uh, let's, let's go. But the reality is that there are two ways of saying it. Number one, uh, I'm not sure yeshiva speak is going to make it in the English language uh, because as yeshiva speak, um, people want to enter a larger world. They cease to really go with yeshiva speak and they only speak it as a little bit of an internal language. But we've seen the migration of a whole range of words from uh, Yiddish to English. Uh, everybody now knows what chutzpah is. Yep. Um, and we've also seen the migration of food as an element of culture and uh, cool. yeah I'm, I'm, I'm my own favor of that I, 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 I don't think um, uh, except maybe for the food that it makes for a very rich culture <laughs> but it's certainly a, a highly significant component of uh, uh, of culture but when I'm talking about uh, uh, English or from speak or yeshivish, and I don't mean anything quite as limited as that, but that uh, I'm talking about it as as a, as a second language or an, an other language for speakers, uh, not as uh, their only language, and and my whole notion of the way. Ideally, Jews live is that they live in two worlds, right? One of my one of my chapters is called "Divided Loyalties," right? But those uh, div divided cultural loyalties and identities, not divided political loyalties. In other words, I'm I'm not in favor of of of, of Jews spying for Israel um, in in the United States, or for that matter, spying in Israel. Uh, we've been we've been asked uh, essentially where do you differ from uh, uh, from Dubnov, for example. Uh, that that uh, that I have all of Dubnov's bo books on my shelf, and I'm I doubt very much whether Dubnov had ever heard of me. <laughs> Dubnov is a hero. Yes, yeah. except that I have to confront something that Dubnov did not have to confront. Namely, exactly that uh, the um, uh, Sephardic and Eastern Jews are not some kind of outlying marginal phenomenon f for the Jewish nation as they were in Dubnov's time. Even then, it was it was more it was necessary to take them more seriously as you know, part and parcel of, of, of a Jewish nation. But since 90% of the Jews are, uh, were speakers of Yiddish at that time, it was uh, harder to see. Today, we certainly don't have that luxury. I can't uh, sink into a kind of Yiddishist uh, fantasy. And that's exactly what we've been talking about for the last few minutes, about what could provide that internal language of Jewish intimacy that includes Jews everywhere, all over the world. First and foremost, Daniel, it's never boring with you, never. Thank and you. Michael, your rigor and intellectual inquiry is stands on its own and it's so grateful. We're so blessed to have you.